Hello guys, welcome to Ankit Sunil Alwits. Today I'm going to teach you how to take perfect history for your abdomen case or gastrointestinal case in general medicine. So let's start. <laughs> So first we have to start with patient detail. In patient detail we will ask the name. Name is the identity of the patient. Then we have to ask the age as an old age malignancy would be common. Then is the gender. Males are prone for X-linked recessive disease. Females are prone for autoimmune disease. Uh, then we have to ask the address. Certain places would be endemic for certain diseases. Ask the education. How much he can understand his disease. What is his occupation his socioeconomic status as TB is prevalent in low socioeconomic status in India then we have to present the chief complaint remember in chief complaint we have to present only specific problem which is bothering patient the most for which the patient have come to the hospital do not present all the complaints whatever patient is saying just ask the patient what problem have made him to come to the hospital then we have to present the history of presenting illness you have to present it like Patient was apparently well these many months back when he or she noticed abdomen distension. Then you have to elaborate all symptoms whichever patient is saying with their duration and chronological order. Remember history of presenting illness should be clear and should be easy to understand for everyone. In history of presenting illness you can omit the irrelevant details. If the patient is having decompensated liver disease you can omit the history of headache if you find it is irrelevant. So because if you add on whatever patient is saying then it will complicate your history and it would be very difficult to reach at one diagnosis. So now we will see each symptom in detail how to elaborate them. Like for pain remember the mnemonic Socrates in this S is for sight O is for onset pain could be uh, sudden in case of perforation or could be of a rapid in pancreatitis or any obstruction or it could be gradual in case of neoplasm. In character, pain would be generally constant, dull aching in case of there is a hepatosplenomegaly because of stretching of capsule. Colicky pain means it's an intermittent pain generally related to the intestinal cause. S is for severity. Severity is generally always subjective. In case there is a peptic ulcer perforation, so they, that will result to peritonitis and because of that patient won't move patient would be sitting idly or, or lying down he won't make any movement because by making any movement his pain will aggravate so you can know the severity is high in case of intestinal or gallstone disease patient will keep on changing his position and location as he won't get the relief then is the radiation whether the pain is radiating from the epigastric region to back in case of pancreatitis pain from the diaphragm could radiate to the supraclavicular force through phrenic nerve which is known as Kehes sign then you have to ask whether it is associated with vomiting loose motions what is the duration uh, how is the course what are its aggravating and relieving factors then here the common uh, differential diagnosis for abdomen in case of abdomen distension you have to ask how is the onset insidious sudden or gradual how is the progression whether it is associated with leg swelling or facial puffiness generally with the case of ascites when there is a abdomen distension it will result to stretching which will result to aching pain all over the abdomen you have to ask whether there is any history of ascitic tap if there is an abdomen distension there could be dyspepsia and heartburn because of GRD dyspnea could be there if there is abdomen distension it will patient may have orthopnea difficulty in breathing because of tense ascites rarely paresthesia in the distribution of lateral cutaneous nerve can occur which is known as myalgia paresthetica this is very very rare what are the common causes of abdominal distension remember these F's then you must know all the causes of ascites and what is the mechanism this is a must know thing uh, the most common cause which you will get of ascites is because of liver disease or because of heart failure nephrotic syndrome and tb abdomen remember ascites is mostly chronic there is a subacute necrosis it will be never acute therefore the skin over the abdomen won't be shiny or stretched generally ascites will occur in case of liver disease when there is approx 50 percent of uh, liver dysfunction is there then it will result into ascites meek syndrome is a triad of fibroma 
with ascites and with pleural effusion there is a difference between anasarca and ascites ascites is localized but anasarca is a generalized swelling in the body with genital swelling is also present the most four common causes is nephrotic syndrome liver disease congestive cardiac failure malabsorption or hypoproteinemia then you have to ask the history of dysphagia dysphagia means there is difficulty in swallowing if there is a pain during swallowing that is called as ordinophagia in dysphagia you have to ask onset duration progression more for solid or liquid or both this is the most important question if dysphagia is more for liquid then it means there is a neurological cause like bulbar or pseudobulbar palsy or stroke if it is more for solid then it is because of neuromuscular causes like mesthenia gravis pharyngeal pause there could be mechanical causes for dysphagia like esophageal carcinoma then you have to ask the history of dyspepsia dyspepsia which is also called as like indigestion sometime what can happen patient may have heartburn heartburn means there is a burning sensation in the epigastric region which patient may mistake it as indigestion so you have to first rule out because if there is a heartburn it means it's a gastroesophageal reflex disease you have to ask about nausea vomiting bloating and discomfort can occur because of aerophagia in which patient swallow a lot of air then you have to ask about the vomiting uh whether it is preceded by nausea nausea means there is a sensation of feeling sick uh, nausea can occur before vomiting in case of migraine also how many episodes of vomiting has occurred what was the volume because if there is high uh, number of episodes of vomiting with high volume the the patient may have electrolyte imbalance and dehydration also if there is a projectile uh, type of vomiting the cause could be of increase in intracranial pressure whether it is blood stain blood stain means there is any um bleeding in the esophagus or in stomach or it is bile stain bile stain means there is a obstruction in the intestinal level below the second part of duodenal whether it is associated with tinnitus headache or diarrhea there are different causes of vomiting like medical causes like viral hepatitis intestinal infection raised icp or diabetic ketoacidosis in meniere's disease patient can have tinnitus hematemesis means blood in vomit and you have to differentiate from hemoptysis hemoptysis means blood in sputum in case of hemoptysis there would be tingling sensation in the throat there would be frothy blood and it would be of alkaline nature but in case of hematemesis patient may have nausea upset stomach it will contain food and it will be of acidic nature because of gastric secretions so you have to ask the number of episode was it mixed with food or not when the blood mix with acid gastric acid its color may change to coffee brown the amount of blood loss you have to assess whether it is associated with melina because if there is any gastric bleed patient will swallow it and it can present as melina is something called pseudo hematemesis in which in patients with upper respiratory bleed the blood may be swallowed and later vomited as altered blood mimicking as upper gi bleed then you have to ask the history of jaundice sometime patient himself will say jaundice remember most of the patient won't say directly it's a jaundice they will say there is yellow discoloration of his urine and eyes there you have to present as history suggestive of jaundice in that you have to ask about onset number of episodes what is the duration what is the color of urine and stool in case of obstructive jaundice there will be high color of urine and clay color of stools in case of hemolytic jaundice there would be a choleric urine and high colored stool you have to ask whether it, it is associated with pruritus pruritus occur because of bile salt deposition in the skin which irritates the nerve that causes itching if the same bile salt form acid and they deposit in the sinus node which can cause dysfunction of the sinus node then it can cause bradycardia pruritus would be common in case of obstructive jaundice or cholestatic jaundice you have to ask whether it is associated with pain or not painless jaundice is generally seen in malignant biliary obstruction whether it is associated with rash and sore throat which is more common in infectious mononucleosis you have to ask history of fever and what is the relation like generally in viral hepatitis Uh, jaundice will occur after the episodes of fever you have to ask for any history of anti tuberculosis drug or anti malaria drug then in the history of fever you have to ask how is the onset what is the duration what is the progression whether it is associated with chills chills is because of sensation of cold which will result into vasoconstriction at the skin rigor occur 
because of increase in the hypothalamic set point which will result into pilo erection muscle contraction which will present as shivering teeth chattering the common causes of fever with chills is malaria uti cholangitis lung abscess then you have to ask whether it is associated with rise in temperature normally there is a phenomena like in the evening cortisol will decrease and bmr will will increase but in tuberculosis this phenomena is exaggerated so therefore evening rise of temperature will occur in case of tuberculosis whether it is associated with vomiting abdomen pain loose motions fever with jaundice you have to suspect malaria leptospira typhus hepatitis here i would like to discuss fever in detail because most of the examiners will ask you this in detail the definition of fever is mean oral temperature more than 37.2 2 degree celsius uh, at 6 am or at 6 pm temperature more than 37.5 with increase in thermostat point in hypothalamus this difference you know like in the evening cortisol will decrease and bmr will increase rectal temperature would be higher than oral temperature by 0.4 degree celsius oral temperature would be higher than axillary temperature by 0.4 degree celsius 1 fahrenheit is equals to 0.6 degree celsius actually what happens in fever is there are pyrogens and toxin which act on hypothalamus from there then from the hypothalamus the main neurotransmitter which act is cyclic amp and which will increase the thermostat set point in the hypothalamus which will increase the heat production and decrease the heat loss which will present as fever if there is increase in 1 degree celsius it will result into increase in pulse rate by 10 this rule is generally followed in case of fever but in certain diseases there is something called relative bradycardia where temperature is increasing but pulse rate is decreasing the common diseases are typhoid brucellosis leptospirosis meningitis viral influenza there are fever with rash fever with one day of rash would be of chicken pox fever with rash on the fourth day commonly would be of measles with rash on the seventh day could be of typhoid fever with rash with duration less than 7 uh this uh disease could be of dengue there are certain tumors which can also present with fever the most common tumor which present with fever is renal cell carcinoma other tumor which can present with fever are osteosarcoma ewing sarcoma then there are different patterns of fever like continuous fever where the temperature never touches the baseline the most common cause would be of lobar pneumonia infective endocarditis the other type is remnant fever where temperature will fluctuate but it will never touch the baseline the common example is step ladder fever in case of typhoid there is something called intermittent fever where the temperature will touch the baseline and it will keep on fluctuating the cause could be septicemia then there could be a uh, relapsing fever where there is a episode of normal temperature in, in between the two fevers relapsing fevers are divided into there is something called tertian fever which occur on first and third day the common cause is plasmodium vivax or ovule or falciparum there is another division of relapsing is quartan fever where fever occurs in the first and fourth day the common cause is plasmodium malaria there is something called pal abstain fever this type of fever is very very common with lymphoma you have to remember this like there would be a fever for one week then there would be no fever for one week then again there will be fever for again one week so this one week gap would be there in pal abstain which is common in hodgkins lymphoma or hepatocellular carcinoma is another is saddleback then there is something called hyperparesia where the temperature is more than 41 degree centigrade it's a medical emergency the common cause would be pontine hemorrhage or septicemia or meningococcal meningitis or cerebral malaria where the treatment is iv paracetamol and there is another entity which is uh, called as hypothermia where the temperature is less than 35 degree centigrade and there is another entity which is known as hyperthermia where there is uncontrolled increase in the temperature but hypothalamic thermoregulatory set point is normal and unchanged in this there is no pyrogen involved therefore antipyretics do not work in case of hypothermia there are certain types like heat stroke malignant hyperthermia neuroleptic malignant syndrome in this the treatment is physical cooling or giving icelain so here the differential diagnosis of fever generally mass per abdomen 
uh, goes more for the surgical case rather than general medicine case in the history of stools you have to elaborate like what is the amount what is the consistency what is the color melina is a black terry sticky stool which is offensive and the other causes which you have to rule out for melina is if the patient is taking uh, iron tablet or bismuth or he has taken some charcoal for melina there uh, it requires approx 60 ml of blood which should be there in the gut for approx 6 to 8 hours and melina can occur for maximum up to 7 days whether the patient is passing flatus or not there because there could be complete intestinal obstruction also whether it is associated with blood or mucus worms in stool tenesmus tenesmus means patient will have feel to need the pass the stool but his bowel would be empty the most common cause would be bacillary a uh, dysentery or inflammatory bowel disease or impacted stool there could be history of steatorrhea steatorrhea is a clinical feature of malabsorption which would be like bulky smelly uh, there would be history of like patient have to flush it more than once in constipation you have to ask how often patient used to have bowel movements before and how often is now normal bowel frequency is about 3 bowels movements per day to one movement every 3 days and a constipated stool would be hard dry difficult to pass the common causes of constipation would be hypothyroidism lack of dietary fiber hypercalcemia or intestinal obstruction you have to ask the quantity consistency is it painful to pass the stool diarrhea generally causes you have to divide in case of acute and chronic in acute the causes would be of viral etiology or toxics in chronic it could be because of um, malabsorption pancreatic cause or any celiac disease or any inflammatory bowel disease you have to ask the time what is the nature and consistency what is the aggravating and relieving factor whether it is associated with blood or mucus generally if it is associated with blood uh, in the diarrhea the cause could be mostly like shigella Uh, or e coli or inflammatory bowel disease uh, in case of cholera the color of stool could be like rice water you have to ask about any drug or recent food history or travel history if there is if the patient give history of blood in stool then i have to elaborate by saying what is the onset duration progression what is the number of episode remember this word hematochezia hematochezia means there is a bright or frank blood per rectum what it denotes is there is a bleed distal to ligament of teres you have to know in the gi if there is a bleed below ligament of teres it is known as lower gi bleed if there is a bleeding upper to the ligament of teres in the second part of duodenum uh, never forget to ask about uh, any feeling of dripping or frank blood uh, it could be a clinical feature of hemorrhoids uh, the differential diagnosis for rectal bleeding could be hemorrhoids anal fissure inflammatory bowel disease or any colon cancer then in the urine uh, history you have to elaborate what is the daily amount as there could be oliguria in case of hepatorenal syndrome because of uh, cirrhosis of liver what is the color uh, color could be like uh, burgundy color of urine could be there in cause of porphyria what is the frequency uh, there could be increased frequency and dribbling of urine in case of benign prostatic hyperplasia there is be feeling of incomplete voiding you have to ask whether there is any pus discharge or burning sensation in case of uti or pyelonephritis whether it is associated with blood in the urine in case of urinary tract injury or any intravascular hemorrhage analysis is there if through the chief complaint and your history of presenting unless you suspect it's a case of lymphoma then never forget to ask the b symptoms b symptoms are fever drenching night sweat pruritus after the alcohol intake and weight loss more than 10% if these symptoms are there in case of lymphoma it means the prognosis would be poor pedal edema could be there because of malnutrition or cardiovascular disease or any hypoproteinemia there is something called ascites precox in this ascites will occur and then later on leg swelling will occur this the uh, the common cause would be cirrhosis or pericarditis never forget this pericarditis in pericarditis there is selective partial constriction of hepatic vein which is entering the right atrium so it will alter the hepatic venous drainage which will result into hepatic dysfunction and oozing out of ascitic fluid in renal pathology uh there would be facial puffiness also with 
with pedal edema in cardiac generally pedal edema would be at the dependent parts like ankle then you have to ask the history of easy fatigability weakness and tiredness easy fatigability means small amount of work which he used to do uh, easily before but now he is feeling fatigue in that that is called as easy fatigability remember this is very very important to ask the history of other systems central nervous system you have to ask because it could be related because of wilson disease or hepatic encephalopathy or because of gaucher's disease which is a storage disorder renal system you have to ask because there could be hepatorenal failure you have to ask history of cardiovascular system like constrictive pericarditis cuff with sputum or any hemoptysis because of tuberculosis in case of 10% ascites can cause hydrothorax especially on the right side because it is said that on right side of the diaphragm there is higher number of pores which will pass the fluid from the abdomen patient may have orthopnea because of tense ascites or bilateral diaphragm palsy menstrual history uh, you have to present only if you feel it is relevant to your case otherwise no need to present in personal history you have to ask whether the person is allergic to any medication or there is any uh, features of encephalopathy changes like altered sleep rhythm or confusion you have to ask uh, history of significant weight loss significant weight loss means there is a involuntary weight loss which is more than 10% of his body weight in 6 month or more than 5% of his body weight in 1 month significant weight loss could be there because of Uh, malignancy or tuberculosis you have to ask the history like whether there is a loosening of clothes or a loosening of ring uh, the, whether there is any reduced appetite the patient is not feeling hungry or the patient is not having food because of some painful ulcers on his mouth or you have to ask whether there is any early fullness or early satiety Uh, due to organomegaly or malignancy in the abdomen which is compressing the stomach have to ask the history of addiction especially alcohol and smoking we'll be discussing smoking history taking in detail in respiratory system as smokers are at risk of esophageal carcinoma colorectal cancers crohn disease and pod then you have to ask the diet history because in vegetarians or pure vegans there could be deficiency of vitamin b12 we have to ask history of skin tattoo because skin tattoo is a risk factor for hepatitis b and c uh, you have to ask about any high risk behavior why alcohol history is very very important because alcohol can affect the hepatobiliary system by causing alcoholic hepatitis remember in alcoholic hepatitis person can have fever because of the inflammation there would be a fever in alcohol history you have to ask what is the type what is the frequency what is the quantity then you have to calculate how many units the person is consuming what is the duration if the patient has stopped drinking then you have to ask sober since when when was the history of last binge the other histories which are uh, supposed to ask but you can skip also if you do not want to where he used to drink what was the purpose where whether he was accompanied or alone what is the money he spent on his drink what is his attitude towards alcohol now let's know some basics about alcoholic history like there is some safe limit for alcohol like for men it is 21 unit per week and for women it is 14 unit per week there is hazardous drinking like if when men is drinking 3 unit per day and the woman is more than 2 unit per day there is a difference in the safe limit of gender because of their metabolic response toward the alcohol is different in men and women you can calculate the number of unit through this formula number of unit would be equals to volume into per- percent of alcohol content wholly divided by 1000 Uh, approx 1 unit is equals to 1 peg which is approx 6 ml of the spirit like whiskey or gin or vodka which is equals to 10 ml of ethanol uh, there is a definition for alcoholism where you cannot uh, classify all the persons who are drinking alcohol as a alcoholic person would be alcohol dependent or alcoholic where the alcohol is causing a medical problem a uh, dependence problem a psychiatric problem a social problem in his life now uh, through dsm 5 there is a new term alcohol use disorder where alcohol related all the disorders are categorized under one heading which could be classified based on these 11 questions you have to ask where you can classify the person under the category of mild moderate and severe alcohol use disorder uh, but for the clinical purposes still the cage questionnaire is very very common but you have to remember it, it can only suggest a problem drinking 
when uh, there is more or equal to two questions are answered to positive as it is very easy to remember it will identify heavy drinkers but it is not very sensitive in past history it was whether the person had similar episodes like this or there is any history of jaundice blood transfusion remember if there is any positive past history tabulate it in chronological order for whether they have traveled to any endemic uh, places uh, the endocrine history is important here because primary biliary cirrhosis and autoimmune hepatitis is associated with thyroid disease non alcoholic fatty liver disease is associated with diabetes and obesity in the family history remember always draw a pedigree chart and a family tree and mention about whether there is a consanguineous marriage or not because in consanguineous marriage there is autosomal recessive diseases are very very common you have to ask whether there is any such illnesses in family especially like jaundice or liver disease uh, because like wilson disease would be common or hereditary spirocytosis is very very common you have to rule out all these diseases never forget to take social history like most of the examiners uh, stress on this social history because we often tend to forget to take social history in social history you have to present like whether the person is married or not how many children he is having whether he uh, lives with family or, or alone because we need to ask whether there is someone uh, who is there to take care of him or not the components of social uh, history is education and occupation upbringing home life financial condition what is the home type lifestyles community support sexual history then you have to summarize your history by mentioning the patient's age his occupation with his chief complaints if through your history you have come across some uh, diagnosis and then mention all the positive history which are pointing toward your diagnosis uh, diagnosis then you can present his chief complaint his positive uh, history and some negative history to rule out other diseases and then you can give your differential diagnosis in the sequence of priority like number 1 i am thinking of this number 2 thing so generally Uh, the common cases would be of ascites ascites itself can have lots of causes which you have to go through there could be a case of hepatosplenomegaly leukemia lymphoma generalized lymphadenopathy wilson or hemolytic anemia uh, here are the three points which you should remember while presenting your case remember you can ask whatever you want to ask but uh, during your exam present only relevant history because uh, whatever you will present examiner will be asking you why did you ask this if you do not have the reason then you will be in trouble so it's better to present only relevant and significant positive and negative history which is pointing toward your diagnosis and negative histories which are ruling out diagnosis so this is very very important must remember it always and present the positive history in detail whatever are the positive history present them first then present the negative history if the examiner say i'm running out of time or you uh, there is very less time to save the time you can say if there is no significant history then you can present like no significant history instead of saying no history of jaundice or such illnesses in family so instead of uh, elaborating the family history you can just directly say no significant family history. and you can move on to next heading this is just optional all the best guys see you in my next video bye bye